All right. Hello, traders. It is Wednesday, March 27th. Hard to believe how fast this year is already clipping along. We're a couple of weeks away from Q1 earnings season. So we're going to be able to take a look at our previous picks, talk about what went right or what went wrong, do some market analysis. So I'm going to start there and I'm going to go into my last two picks for my last video, one of which was Microsoft. And that actually was Harry's pick from uh, last Wednesday's live event. I like Microsoft. I still like it, even though the stock's heading lower. This is where the Sunday live event recording came out. This is Friday's price action. I've got a 15 minute chart up. My instructions are pretty clear. Look for a very dull market this week. We don't have a lot of drivers. We don't have a lot of economic releases. We've got a holiday coming up, so that's gonna take a trading day out. You need to buy dips. And if you're doing that, you need to look for relative strength. And we're going to use LRSI. So Microsoft opened lower on Monday. There's LRSI. Oh, you get your first little cross right in here. But this is where the previous LRSI dip took place. And so this is lower than this. So no, we would not want to buy that dip. And we don't have the heavy volume that I'd mentioned you need. Ah, here comes another dip. No, this is still not higher than these previous points. Another one here. No. So there's no reason to get long this stock. Uh, the other stock that I had mentioned was DKNG. No volume there. And you can see the stock is selling off. It had some news today, NCAA related. And that's probably why the stock was looking so strong. So, I mean, there's really no volume to get behind this stock this week. You did have a nice little LRSI cross in here that you could have made money on, but in general, the market's been drifting lower. And then my final is AEO, which is what I showed you last week. And last Wednesday's event was right in here on March 20th. And that stock had actually moved up nicely. So. Harry, let's uh, take a look at Microsoft. I know you made money on that. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I like it. I still like it. If you got in last Wednesday and if you got out on Thursday or Friday, you made uh, a really nice return on that. Um, mm -hmm. you probably, you know, it was at 423 when I recommended it. And then on Friday, it got up to 429. So you could have done really well. Even if you got out on uh, Monday, uh, you still would have done fine. So now it's coming up on the daily uh bouncing off of the 15 ema there i still like the setup i still like the overall trend on the stock i think you have some decent support here it's actually a good stock for a bullish put spread um you know if you could get something in the 400 405 range um a few weeks out that might be uh a good play on microsoft i don't think it's uh you know it might uh it might chop around a little bit, but I think uh, I think it's pretty safe over those levels. And so I'm looking at the 405, 40250, uh, currently 36 by 48, 36 cents bid offered at 48, and that is the April 19th expiration. So uh, you just need a little bit more. We'd like to get 50 cents for a spread like that, but it would certainly work. Yeah. And someone asked, how does Meta look? Um, for a bullish put spread. Uh, well, I mean, if you draw your trend line here, you take the bottom of February 13th, connect it to the bottom of February 21st, then again, March 11th, then again, March 15th, again, March 19th, and then today. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six touches on this line. It's a very viable uh, support line here on Meta. Um, and then you have your uh, 462, which is your moving average, your 50-day moving average. If you can get, let's say, go out to April 19th, and you're looking at maybe a 465, um, 460 bullish put spread, a 464.55 bullish put spread, if you can get that in for a dollar, you need it to dip a little bit more. It's going for around 75 cents now. But 464.55 bullish put spread April 19th on Meta 
If you can get that in for a dollar, and like I said, you probably need it to drop to around 487 for that to happen. That would be, um, uh, pro I would like that trade. That would be good. Okay, nice. Uh, I did want to uh, mention something, and that was, I think you did that Microsoft call debit spread in the challenge account, right? And how is I the challenge it. account yeah. going? I did it for a, uh, let's see here. Um, I got a dollar, um, I did it for a dollar eight seventy nine, and I closed it for $2.83. So I took a dollar oh four, um, $500 profit in the um, challenge account. Um, so that one worked out pretty well. I think I just closed it the next day on that bump up. I took advantage of the, uh, you know, sometimes gaps up on the morning are gifts. You take them, you open them, you're done. I took it and, uh, that worked out really well right now in the challenge account. I have, um, the Apple calls that go out to August. Those are, um, recovered quite a bit actually thanks to today. Um, and uh, you have a lot of events between now and August. There was a, a ton of unusual option activity on Apple. And when you see it on a stock like that, it is, um, you know, when you, you, this, you get um, unusual option activity on a lot of different, you know, retail like GME and all of that. But um, when you get it on a stock like Apple and you get it to the size that it was, you're generally looking at uh, some institutional uh, buying uh, or a large institutional uh, client that's buying there. And so when I saw that, I figured Apple is basing support at 170, which it is. Um, so if it drops below that, I can close it for a loss. But as long as it stays above that, I'm good on it. Um, the I got the average price is $3.83 on those. It's now going for around 320, 315. So it's pretty much right in the area. So that's good. And I also have a spy strangle on, which is down a bit today. I should have closed that in profit on the open. I did not. Um, but uh, any type of movement towards the end of the day, just like we had yesterday, would put those that strangle into profit. So those are the two positions I have on right now. And um, and I'll probably maybe be looking to add something before the long weekend. Okay, awesome. Well, a uh, couple of points in what you had mentioned. One is that you were taking profits on your Microsoft call debit spread. Why? Well, because the market right now is doing a lot of chopping around. So we have a nice little rally. You got to take great gains when you get these nice little rallies in here. You don't hold out for the very last nickel because you're going to get Mm, this kind of drop, okay? Now we've got another nice little rally. So you've got an opportunity in here where you can make money with the market continuing to go high, but it's really getting into more of a hit and run type of market where you've got these cycles, these ebbs and flows, and that's how you have to approach your trading. So you, if I go back, it'll be a little bit easier to show you on a uh, previous chart where you've got the S&P 500, you've got this nice rally, so you're long in here and you're just kind of riding your trades higher until you start to see some price compression. Well, now you're taking gains, you're waiting to reload, but you're recognizing that the long-term trend is up. And so when you get these drops like this, this is when you're looking for confirmation of support because once we bounce off of it, now you're back in a mode where you're starting to get back into long positions. You're looking for that next leg higher. And then when the market starts to compress and that momentum starts to wane, you are taking gains. And so oftentimes traders get into this mentality, especially when you're starting. It's like, I have to make $500 a day. I have to make $500 a day. Well, the market doesn't move in a linear form. It does this. It goes up, it pulls back. It goes up, it pulls back. That's how you have to approach your trading. There are going to be ebbs and flows. So right now, with the market in an absolute standstill, and there's no news to drive it, there's nothing to drive it. Our only chance for that was the FOMC last week. So 
Now we're looking for a dip. We're looking for signs of support. We're looking for those stocks that when we had this dip, preserved all of their gains and are actually starting to move higher because once the market finds support, then we're gonna get that next leg higher. And those stocks are already telling you that they wanna go higher. So that's when you start getting into those positions on support, you ride them higher, you wait for the market to start showing signs that that rally is gonna stall out and you take gains. So your p and could be zero dollars, zero dollars, zero dollars, a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, five hundred dollars, and then you're back in waiting mode, zero, zero, zero. So you're going to hit your five hundred dollars a day. You're just not going to hit it every day. And what happens is that you start forcing trades. Uh oh, I got to make my five hundred dollars today. Well, the market is crap. The market doesn't give a Force shit how much you think you want to make a day. By the way, right? Yeah. And what I found is that. A lot of traders would do well to have a better understanding of basic statistics. You say you want to make $500 a day, right? What you're really saying is you want to make $10,000 a month. That's what you want. And, and you got to look in terms of averages and you have to look in terms of overall, right? So just because you didn't make $500 that day, what, what you're looking at, do you average out end of month near your target? And if you can't, and if you're not, it's maybe because you're, account balance is too low to hit that and in order to hit it you have to take risk that is too high um or there's something off with your trading and your journal can help you with that but if you're looking at day to day to day i mean you might as well say well then i need to make a hundred dollars an hour you know or i need to make this amount a minute it doesn't work like that you need to look at it over time the long averages right think about how index funds work they go up they go down but people buy into them as a long-term investment because they know over time, it's going to go up, right? You know, just like our people holding SPY during that bear market, it dropped all the way down below 400, down to three. They just held because of the long term trend. You got to think, you know, what is your time frame and think of it like a salary and you have to be hitting those marks. Another thing I want to touch on with statistics was a, there's a lot of talk on drawdowns and, and, um, you know, what is the proper drawdown amount? You have to think in terms of probabilities. Let's say you take a stop and you're looking at the daily chart and support is $7 away, right? And your profit target is a dollar, just one dollar. You want a one dollar target. So if you were to hold down through that support of $7, and if it breaks it, you're out, right? So let's say when you lose, you're gonna lose $7. When you win, you're gonna win $1, right? So if 80% of the time that happens, then eight times you win a dollar, it's $8. Two times you lose seven, then you lose 14, doesn't work. 90% of the time, let's say that trade is successful. Now you've won $9, nine out of 10 times you win a dollar, one out of 10 times, you lose seven. At the end of 10 times, you're up $2. Ah, there you go. You need about an 87% win rate for a trade like that. So you have to think in terms of probabilities, in terms of are you willing to hold this trade down to support? But what is your win rate probability? And this is really where journaling helps. If you look into that type of trade, that type of setup, and you go, okay, I have a 90% win rate over hundreds of trades or whatever. And that's why practicing paper trading, all that is so valuable. I have this likelihood on this setup in this type of market to for this trade to be successful, then your drawdown is fine, right? As long as you, you project it out over 10 trades and you can, that means you can project it over 100 trades or whatever, um, you're out ahead in profit. So use your win rate probabilities on those setups to help you better understand what drawdown you're willing to accept on a trade. If you only have a 50% win rate, well, then, you know, your, uh, your drawdown better not be more than what you're taking profit for or else you'll wind up in the negative. It's, it's not that, it's not advanced statistics here. It's just a matter of journaling 
understanding the setups, understanding the probabilities and your win rates on those setups, and then applying them to where support is, how long you're willing to hold that position for, and what type of loss you're willing to take. Along those same lines, you have to look for the right chart pattern. So if I'm looking at Pepsi right now, this thing is all over the board. How do I know if I'm in somewhere in the middle of this garbage, how do I know where I'm going to find support or what my possible target could be? I mean, you want stocks where you can predict where that stock is going to be going in the future. And I'm going to go through a couple of stocks here that I'm looking at. Uh, target doesn't look too bad, but you're starting to see these tiny little candles on this breakout. So uh, I did see uh, Verizon on the Green Royal Flush search today. So you've got this nice compression here. And I can put up the 10 squeeze, whoops, 10 squeeze indicator. And we're breaking out of a compression here. We're above AV Web E. You can see horizontal resistance there where the open was today. This is not the kind of stock that I have to rush into. It is a telecom stock, but the sector, the group is getting a little bit of love today. And if I go into the five minute chart, I can see, and this is what I mentioned earlier in the chat room, I'm like, you do not need to rush into this stock. And you can see how it's been drifting lower and holding VWAP right now. But I do like it. I think that uh, the stock has some pretty decent volume given you know, that the whole market doesn't have a lot of volume. You can see, let's take off that 10 squeeze indicator. You'll be able to see, okay, this is a kind of breakout that I'm looking for. It's got some love today. What's my downside on it? This AV Web E, would I go gangbusters in here? No, I think the stock is ready to start grinding higher, challenge this high right here, and perhaps even get through it. So my support right here is very close by, the open of today's candle. So my downside is fairly limited, fairly contained. I want that AV Web E to hold. I want this open today to hold, but I've got decent upside to it. And the stock has got some nice orderly price action to it. So VZ, that's going to be my pick today. Nice. I like it. I like VZ. Um, I still have it centered down yet on my pick, but I like this break above us, the SMA. I like the, the, the confirmation that we got today. Um, got an ATR of 0.58. So when you size the position, keep that in mind. But um, I do like it. It's a, it's a nice, uh, it's a very nice setup. That's the type of setups you should be looking for. Um, and you can have some confidence in the continuation there. I have a question. Go longer here. term. I'm sorry, go longer term, go deep in the money, go out a few months yep. and buy options that have a delta of 0.7 or higher. And the yes, it might be a boring stock, but the options are also going to be very cheap. So you'll be able to leverage the position using options, deep in the money options on it. Yeah. Um, that would be the, to, to, for Peter who asked what would be the tra best trading play for it, but Pete just answered you. Um, if this day closes red, it'll be the first five red days in a row for a long time. December 2022, does increase red days increase the probability for a green day? Do you focus on this in any way? No, it does not. It doesn't. The whole idea that, oh, now we're due. We're due for this, right? You might as well play roulette and get like five reds in a row and be like, oh, I'm going to go black. It, 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 it doesn't matter there. In fact, it, it, there is some memory here. It, it's actually more likely that it will continue red um, because what you're getting is a bearish trend, right? But what you're looking at here is low volume. You're looking at very low volume uh, red days. I'm not saying that it's not significant if we get five red days in a row here. It is because uh, certainly it means that at the very least the market's taking a little bit of a breather, or a little bit of a pause. Uh, and there's been a lot of chatter out there about a pullback. But uh, until I start seeing some volume in this market, I'm not going to put much credence either way on that. But the whole idea that something is due is, is, is the ruin of many trader. You know, it's, it was down yesterday. It was down this day. It, it's got to go up tomorrow. It, it never it never works like that. Um, Moderna so, for a bullish put spread. What do I think? Uh, let me take a look. Uh, it certainly has a good setup for it. Um, it might be good for a watt M, uh, but if you can get below 99 on Moderna for a bullish put spread, which would give you two SMEs right there, but, and, and, and you'd have some 
uh, some trend line support as well. So you'd really have almost three levels of support. If you can do 99, 98, yeah, there you go. Uh, April 19th, uh, the 99 to 98 bullish put spread. If you can get that for 20 cents, um, you need a little bit of a pullback, but if you can get that for 20 cents, um, I would take that. You can even go out to, I hate going out much farther, but 99, 98, um, on April 26th, you might be able to get that for 20 cents, but it's somewhere around there is where I would look to put a bullish put spread in and get a little bit of a pullback and, uh, you should be, you should be good to go on that. So that's, that's where I would kind of look for it. But, um, I, I do like it for a bullish put spread. I do think it's, uh, it's comfortably above its SMAs. I'm, we made a nice, uh, a nice uh, trade on that in the in the challenge account um so yeah it also i just hovered over earnings on uh five two i don't believe it's confirmed but that's about when it should be so yes plenty of time we don't sell those bullish put spreads that span the earnings date they must expire before the earnings release very important Gizmo says, what I struggle with the most is identifying with which days I can be 100% confident. You can never be 100% confident, so don't don't try to uh, kill good for perfection. Uh, as size big, to other days, a day like this can make up for 10 LPTE days, low probability trading environment days. You're, you're right. So if you size wrong on wrong days, it's very detrimental to your overall results at the end of the month. Well, look, I mean, there's some clear things, right? I mean, you're looking for volume on the market you're looking for a clear direction on the market uh gap downs that open when you gap down that reverses up and fills the gap with some volume and you get this nice uh upward trend for the day um those are the days when you see the volume you see the trend um you can be fairly confident that okay i can start uh going long or same thing reverse going short increase my size um, and really capitalize on those days where I'm getting definitive movement in a direction with volume. So that really is what you're looking for, definitive movement with direction and volume. I have a question. Hello, last week's run up after the FOMC was according to some because of the three rate cuts and the dot plot maintained. Do you think it's relevant? Uh, the Fed really didn't say anything new last week at all. In fact, if there was a reason to sell, it would have been based on their hawkish statements and the market didn't sell off. The market had already priced in what they were going to say. And if I take a look at the M30 chart, it'll be easy. I'm 15, I'll even do. This is where the Fed reaction came out. So you can see the pink line that I drew. We're kind of drifting down to that level, but we're still above the Fed statement. So this type of price action, it's like a leaky wet diaper, you know, it's death by a thousand cuts. It's just horrible to go through, you know, it, nobody likes trading this kind of garbage in here and it's light volume. So the temptation is, well, I got long in here and I lost money. I got long in here, eh, it didn't work out, I lost money. But hey, you know, I've seen some people do some shorts. Maybe I'll try the short side. Yeah, yeah, those look better. Maybe the market's ready to roll over. So then you start getting into this short mentality because that's, yeah, that's the side I should really be on. And out of nowhere, boom, you're going to get lift off. And all these shorts are going to get squeezed out you're going to be scrambling to cover your short positions. You're also going to be twisted mentally because you were bullish long, long, long. I want to buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip. And now I'm not so sure. Maybe I want to start shorting. So you start entertaining those thoughts. And then your original thought, which was buy the dip, turns out to be right. But you're on the wrong side of the market. And then the market lifts off. You take a bunch of losses on your shorts and you miss the move higher which that is completely where your focus should have been. I'm going to sit on my hands. I'm going to sit on my hands and I'm going to sit on my hands. And when I start seeing a double low, double bottom, higher low, I start seeing the market grind higher, some volume come in, some stack green candles. Then I'm going to be looking for, to enter my long positions because I want to join 
this move right flipping here. So, no, I don't think the Fed really had anything new to say. We want economic releases to remain strong. We got the jobs report coming up a week from Friday. I think it's going to be a good number. I think the ISM numbers are going to be good as well next week. And we're coming up on earnings. That tends to have a bullish bias. I'm so actually starting to see some, you know, the Ackermans of the world and all those type of kind of more loud in, investors from that community starting to come out saying that they, you know, don't cut the rates. Just, just keep them where they are. The economy's strong. Unemployment's low. Jobs are fine. There's no reason for you to cut rates right now. Just, just hold off. Leave them as it is. We're doing fine. Uh, they're clearly, you know, uh, afraid of uh, inflation coming back with any type of rate cut. But, um, you know, these are the same people that were screaming for rate cuts just a little while ago. Uh, so I'm starting to see a little bit of a of a turn. But I mean, look, there's no doubt that the market wants rate cuts. I mean, rate cuts means cheap money. Cheap money means companies like Apple, NVIDIA and all these companies that have all the money in the world uh, can get more and they can use it and they can reinvest and they can build and they can grow. So um, the problem with cutting rates is, of course, uh, it becomes an inflationary environment. So it's, it's uh, but um, obviously, I think uh, that is. You know, every year the market has a story in 2020 you had COVID and then you had the, the Ukraine war and you had, uh, you know, this year it's rate cuts. Rate cuts is the story of the market when and how many and how much. Um, There's also another side of the rate cuts and why corporations like them. And it's not to reinvest in plant and equipment. It is to issue very cheap debt so that they can buy back their shares. And about 50% of the outstanding shares have been retired in the last decade. You take 50% out of the market flow, it's significant. And yes, that is a force that drives the market higher because these companies are out there bidding for their own stock. So they don't have that tailwind right now, but I'm telling you from 2010 to 2020, that was a very, very powerful tailwind. So in our can you check Unity 25 calls August 16th and loading shares at this level? Also thoughts on Apple lawsuit. I have no thoughts on the Apple lawsuit. It's 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 not even you know people treated it as as if Apple was found guilty. Um, it, it's still far way off. It's going to be a while. Obviously, you see the the support at 170 in Apple, and you see the market price action on Apple today is positive. Um, and uh, the uh, Unity, I don't see anything about Unity software that would make me want to buy it or to buy those calls or to load up at this level um, unless you have, I mean, that's where you get into a, if you have some sort of fundamental argument on Unity, um, maybe, but I there's nothing technically here on Unity until you break, you know, maybe 28 that you could start thinking about getting bullish and then you have uh you really have to get through 34 before i would even think about buying unity so that that's just me i don't see any reason to be bullish on unity do you see any reason to be bullish on unity there pete you i didn't even know the symbol i had to look it up so no you. Uh, it hasn't been on my radar it hasn't been coming up in the searches which tells me there's really no interest in that I did have someone ask about the unusual option activity that uh, you saw in Apple, and will that be in the Wiki 2.0? Yes, it, it will be. I mean, it's not. Look, there's not much to it. Um, it will be. I will address it. it but it's really. Um, I mean, unusual option activity is just that, right? It's it's rodents of unusual size. Uh, it's uh, you, you know, here's the average activity on this option contract. And for some reason, uh, there has been a high level of activity that goes well beyond, let's say, three standard deviations outside of that average. Um, now, if you're looking at, I don't know, uh, a, a contract that's 25 cents and you get, um, you know, 15,000 buys and it's above the average, it doesn't really mean much. But if I'm looking at something like Apple and someone spent over $20 million on out of the money calls, that expire in August, when Apple has a big WWDC event coming in June, 
uh, that tells me that there is a whale out there that has some information. That's not a regular retail trader. That's not a normal trade. Um, so plus with support nearby at 170 and a clear exit, if it falls below that and confirmed below 170, I put all of those things together as, okay, I'm willing to take this loss, but this has a decent upside. So combined, that's why I took the, uh, I took the apple trade. Um, and you know, you just have to kind of judge, you know, I, you know, I get from trade exchange, uh, you know, unusual, um, option activity. There's a lot of sources you can get it from, but, uh, you just have to judge what what option you're looking at. Is it to me? What matters is is it institutional or is it retail? If it's retail, I really don't give a shit because I look, we all know most of retail are morons. But if it's institutional, I'm going to pay attention to it. So, what do I think about TSM? TSM is not doing a whole lot of anything. It needs to break out. You can see how it had this spike up with a sharp reversal off of that high. And since then, it's been drifting lower. So what do I do with that? Well, I set an alert. That's that's <laughs> what I do. I take this resistance level right here, and I set a TTC alert. If the stock can get above that level, which is around $144, then I'm interested if... It's showing relative strength to the market and if the stock has good volume. Right now, it's got nothing. Look at the volume. It's horrible. Get the paddles out. Somebody needs to revive this thing. It is dead. Quick question here. If you can wait me for a bit uh, on... Rates entirely good or bad for banks? Am I viewing this wrongly? Well, I don't know how you're viewing it, but I uh, highly appreciate response. Um, it goes both ways. It, is it good for banks? Well, they get better returns on their reserves, right? Higher rates mean the reserves can earn more interest, contribute more bank income. They have a little bit more um, uh, increased net interest margin there from that. But there's a lot of negative, right? Because it increases their borrowing costs. Banks borrow money all the time. Uh, it can dampen demand for loans. So you get a, you know, an issue on credit demand. You get a higher level of defaults. Um, if you're involved in mortgage lending, higher rates can reduce mortgage refinancing activity. So probably the net net is higher rates are not great for banks, but there is some offset depending on the level of reserves that um, a bank has. I mean, it, it really shouldn't impact your unless you're looking at the finance sector and you're looking at some finance stocks, then maybe. But um, look, lower rates is going to boost the whole market, don't forget. And when the market is going up, generally everything's going to go with it. Think of the market as a gravitational pull. The market's like the sun, right? And so these sec each, each one of the sectors is like a planet. And so they're all going to be affected by the gravitational pull of the market. If the market goes up, the market, it's like the sun getting denser. And more mass and a higher gravitational pull. Harry, I almost had a an explosion over here. Somebody was asking me, uh, Chumley was asking me, what sort of thing would get me uh, to shift from my bearish <laughs> to neutral outlook on SPY? And the next post was, sorry, I meant what gets you from bullish to neutral. Hmm. I am not even remotely bearish. And that is a good question because it's always important for us to know what we want to see from the bullish standpoint, what we want to see from the bearish standpoint. What is it that's going to shift us from one camp to the other? It would be fairly rare to get hit, go from bullish to bearish, but we do have trend reversals. So uh, as far as the market, what I would be looking at to get neutral would be just a very, very sideways trading range where we start to expand the range a bit. So if we just compress, 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 compress very, very tightly at this high, that's bullish because that tells me that buyers are definitely interested. They're simply 
getting rid of some of that supply and then boom, you're gonna get your next leg higher. Very similar to what we saw right in here, okay? This is a bullish pattern. If we start to get some chop back and forth and we start to see some pretty nice dips and we get some nice rallies that can't get through resistance and the market starts heading sideways, then I start to take on more of a neutral posture. Uh, the only other thing I would say that would get me neutral and perhaps even bearish is a buying climax through the upper end of this upward sloping trend line with long stacked green candles and a bearish engulfing candle. That type of smackdown usually would happen on a valuation basis, meaning we start getting through earnings season in April. Everybody gets super excited about earnings season. We get those long stack green candles and then that bearish engulf. That would get me pretty neutral too. It might even get me a little bit short term bearish looking for retracement. So those are the two things I'll be watching for. I'm not seeing any of that right now. Um. So Gizmo's asking about uh, LRSI and HA reversals. Um, look, you, both of them are trend indicators, right? You use you can use them in combination. First, realize no indicator is used in a vacuum. They're all contextual. They're all you know you don't you don't want to use too many of them, but um, you got to take context into account. So LRSI can show you the shift in a trend you know lsri starts to dip down usually it's not uh it's not it's more of a reactive trend indicator but it's a very sensitive one so you know do would you want to start going long with lrsi starting to bottom out no the ha reversal on the other hand <coughs> depends if you're looking at it on the daily chart or the five minute chart if it's on the five minute chart and you got to look at vwap you got to look at is this a real trend reversal is there volume there uh, but I would recommend you looking at it at the daily chart. So let's say you have an HA reversal on the daily chart. You have on the on the intraday LRSI is is um, up above 0.8. Um, you have a strong market. You have relative strength. All of that combined, yeah, you that that you know all adds to this is a good long, right? It's just another piece of this could be a good long for me. Uh, that's all it is. Um, you just don't want to add too many, uh, one on top of another. You know, at a certain point, you got to say market strong, stock strong, good daily chart, good relative strength. Everything looks good volume here. I'm going long, right? You want to look at LRSI at that point. You want to look at HA reversal at that point, fine. But at a certain point, you know, the bigger things, the daily chart, the market itself, all that, that's what matters. And I have a chart up with both LRSI and HA candles, and you can see this would be an HA reversal. You got your flat top reds, then you've got a green. Well, that happens to coincide with LRSI. Your question is legitimate. Work with them, experiment with them, use a multitude of variables, try a three eight cross, try, hey, what happens when it goes relative weak and then relative strong? Relative weak, relative strong. Is that a good variable to use? And you're going to get a feel for which ones you like better, which ones you like in certain instances better than others. If there's a really strong trend, HA reversals tend to be more sensitive and you'll have a chance to maybe buy a dip on that stock where LRSI, you may never go through a full cycle and you may not get that alert. But if you have a choppier stock that has lots of dips and lots of rallies, AMD might not be a good one to pick on right now, but uh, you know, there you're going to maybe LRSI is better because it'll force you to wait for that dip to really complete. Experiment with it though. Please take a look at CCJ. Why? I mean, really, why? I, I see nothing about that stock, about that daily chart that gets me excited. When I see someone ask that question, it tells me the first thing you're doing is not looking at the daily chart. Look at the daily chart before anything else. Just talk, do me just put the 50, 100, and 200 simple moving averages on the daily chart. And then put the 15 EMA or 8 EMA, either one. Don't, don't care. 
Um, but put those simple moving averages on. If you do that, you will see CCJ is solidly between its 200-day moving average, its 50-day moving average, which converges with its 100-day moving average, meaning it is bouncing around between those two with no definitive reject direction, and it's currently just in horizontal compression here. There's low volume. The thing hasn't had above average volume since March 15th. There's absolutely nothing about CCJ that should cause you to even give it a second glance other than put an alert on the on the S, the high SMA and the low SMA. And if it breaks one of those two, it might be a good short or a good long, but even then, I doubt it. So there's just li literally no reason to, to look at that stock. Um, so uh, are there differences in the trade I take solely in the challenge account, not in my main account? Well, yeah, of, of course, I'm not taking... Uh, 10,000 shares of, you know, BKNG in my challenge account. Um, and also, I'm probably not going to take as many risks in the challenge account um, because I can hold the risks in the larger account. I can I can hold through a drawdown in the larger account if I have confidence in the stock, in the position, in the daily chart, whatever it is, whereas I have much more restrictive uh, uh, kind of uh rules in place for the challenge count. Also, I follow the Wiki 1.0 generally in the challenge account, whereas in the larger account, I'm doing some Wiki 2.0 stuff. But the challenge account is meant to be a teaching guide. I don't, it's not the money, it's whatever. I'm talking, you know, I'm doing that account so people can learn from it. Uh, and they need to learn Wiki 1.0 stuff before anything else. Uh, so I'm not doing any crazy fancy Wiki 2.0 crap in the challenge account. So those are the kind of uh, differences, obviously, other than position size. Uh, uh, let's see here. Is Any NVIDIA good? a good short here? No, it's not a good no. short. No, it so is not. From, from a technical standpoint, at very minimum, and this is getting into more of a sideways trading range here, you would need to take out at minimum this AVWAP E with follow through. Just poking below it is not going to be enough. And it has to come on heavy volume. Right now, it's range bound. So if you wanted to, and, and you know, we're talking about alerts. They're so dang important because they don't require you to put any capital up. You have zero emotional attachment to this trade. None whatsoever. This is simply going to let you know when the stock might be worth looking at. And you set your alerts when you're flipping through charts, pick a horizontal resistance level, pick a horizontal support level. You can also draw upward trend lines until that trend line's breached. I don't even want to think about it. So I'm going to do all three right now, and I'm going to show you how to do that. I'll click there, and I'll click there. Until some of these support or resistance lines are breached, I have no interest in it. Could I sell it out of money bullish put spread? Uh, yeah, maybe on it, but, uh, and those option implied volatilities are relatively high right now. So uh, that could be a viable strategy for a stock like this, but it's in no man's land right here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, look, when I hear it, when I see a question like that, I know what you're thinking and in, in sort of like, wow, a pullback in the video would be massive, right? Like, wow, I could, I, what if it, you know, everyone wants the, I bought a couple of puts and I wake up and it dropped $40. And you see that often enough with a stock like the video, you think, great, maybe that'll happen here. It certainly looks bearish today. But, you know, just try to increase your odds, right? Can that happen? Could you make money by shorting a video here? Yeah, you could. You don't want you to come back and say, you told me not to short the video and look, it dropped 100. Yeah, it could, obviously. But... What are your odds here? It could also go up 100. It could also, you know, roar back towards 1,000. It's not um, it's not a, a high probability play. It's just a play, right? You're just looking at it and going, oh, this thing moves. And there are some traders that love to play ball. Okay, um, play ball. Uh, but it, that's not, if, unless you're looking at the best setups, it's probably not going to work for you. Is cost compressing for a possible bull flag? Look, I don't, I don't hate cost here um, because I like it's bouncing off support of its SMA, but it's certainly not a good long right now. 
um, you need to see confirmation. You need to see it bounce off that SMA. It doesn't break support. It holds. You need to see it hold above that and break out of its compression to the upside. Then you can look to start doing a uh, credit, uh, um, um, a call debit spread on something like uh, something like cost. So, uh, do you see anything there with cost other than the uh, uh, the compression right at support? Yeah, that's all I'm picking up on it right now. Is that it's compressing. Uh, there's nothing of great interest uh, right now on cost. I've set an alert there. I can set a couple of alerts. An upside breakout would be nice. It's just kind of hugging its uh, AV web E. So uh, yeah, it's got to get some life. It's got to get movement. There's no volume in it right now. So I would certainly wouldn't be bearish on it. I mean, this is such a powerful move higher right here it got a little ahead of itself so they slapped it down after earnings and now it's able to hold that and gradually over time you're going to see buyers get a little more aggressive a little more aggressive a little more aggressive and when they can start getting through some of these horizontal resistance lines that i've drawn then below av web b you could sell an out of the money bullish put spread on that or yes you could do your call debit spread if you're more aggressive and if the market is starting to show you that it is going to go higher the secret formula what is the market doing if the market sideways like this am i going to be buying a call debit spread on cost no i'm going to be selling it out of the money bullish put spread because i don't have a market tailwind. If we start stacking some green candles and the S&P is starting to move higher and cost goes through these resistance levels, then yes, I would want to do a call debit spread because I have a tailwind. Someone asked about CI. CI is a beautiful long, absolutely beautiful long here. Broke through its um, uh, Algo line there, it broke right. Uh, that was Skater 88.51. Um, CI is a great long. Um, it's also at an all time high. A lot of things going for this stock. Uh, and it's not like it went parabolic, so it's not that extended from its EMA. I mean, I like CI so much, it may be my pick of the week. So um, CI is a very good long. Whereas opposed to um, uh, Vegas 2772, asked about uh, Tiva. Uh, Tiva looks like a good long. I mean, you look at the daily chart, but you can easily miss. Take the top of 215, connect it to the top of 226, 35, 38, so on. It just keeps going, and you have a lot of you got a lot of contact on this, and you're looking at some pretty strong resistance there on that trend line, that um, H plus trend line, uh, at 1444. So what you do is you draw that trend line, you click set alert, you're done, you're out, you forget about it, alert goes off, great. Now you know Tiva went above that trend line, make sure it confirms, you're great. Um, and yeah, Skater, I agree. Just CI, perfect. Love it. Great pick. What do you think of CI there, Pete? Yeah, it looks good. Uh, I had one that came up earlier this morning. I was just looking for... Uh, Actually, I was in some bearish searches seeing what had broken down. And I wasn't looking to go short. I just wanted to see, oh, what's weak today? And DLTR was one that had come up. Actually, it was a post earnings, week after earnings. That's where I saw it. Yeah, there's DLTR. This is kind of interesting in here. Four-day trading. Okay? Four-day trading. Do not swing this is it's had some weakness, but if it can get through these two moving averages right here, that 100 day and the 200 day, it's a little compression here. It's starting to move higher. It's got a lot of gap that it can fill in here. And if you've got some intraday price movement, you can see the nice relative strength today. And you can see the market's actually starting to get above uh, VWAP here. So we've put it in a base. We're starting to grind higher a little bit, which is nice then yeah, DLTR, I would day trade this. I have no problem day trading this. I wouldn't swing trade it though. There you go. Um, let's look at Viking Therapeutics. All right, look, a lot of people have been trading that. VKTX, I don't like it. Um, 
I don't like stocks that don't give a shit about technicals. That stock doesn't give a shit about technicals. I'm not saying it's a bad stock to trade. The daily chart, I guess, looks okay. It's very choppy, but um, it did hold that gap up there. Still, it, it's just a very new sensitive stock. It's, it, it, you know, you can get burned pretty quickly with a stock like that. Uh, the same thing with ARM recently IPO'd. Someone asked about, is there amount of time you'd wait before TA could be done on a stock after IPO? Yeah, a year. What do you think, Pete? Yeah, and it's not showing you anything to really trade off of here anyway. It's in a tight compression. So there's really not a lot to sink your teeth into right now. It's been able to rally up. This was nice. And it's been able to hold all those gains. That's nice. Probably going to head higher versus heading lower. So set a GTC alert right there. We'll use this trend line. That's one way. The other one is to just set a horizontal one. And you can pick almost any of these wicks in here and set one but until it can get through this level close above these levels on heavy volume what you will often see and this is a head fake the institutions know that you're going to be in here getting all gaga over this stock when it pokes its head up through these resistance lines and oh, 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 I got stacked green candles on the open. This is the breakout I've been waiting for. And so you come in and you buy it because this is a nice breakout. And then it just falls right back down. And now you got a 2 or $3 loser and you're like, that looks so good. It looks so promising. What happened? You have to complete the candle. You have to close above it heavy volume and follow through because that follow through is where we make money. So set those alerts. Those will be your good first sign that the stock is starting to show some signs of life. What do I think about Marvel? I think I have 25,000 shares of Marvel. So I should tell you what I think about Marvel. <laughs> um, obviously up today or dollars. I like Marvel. If I didn't like Marvel, I wouldn't have 25,000 shares of it. Um, so, you know, obviously it dropped on its earnings and now it has recovered. It is back above the 50 SMA. It looks like it's confirmed above there. Uh, I think Marvel keeps going. I like it. I have no issues with Marvel whatsoever. Let me do uh, a quick check on Marvel. Cause I'm going to look, I like that bullish put spread could be nice down at the, uh, 65 level, which would be right around that. AVWEP E, you've got the 50 day moving average. Let me see if there's any premium in this at all. Going down to maybe $65. And so we've got a 60, nah, 65, 60. Now it's only about 65, 70. We need, we'd like to get a dollar for that. So it need to pull back and test that 50 day moving average maybe one more time. And then you'd be able to get that credit there. But if it can do that, hold that level. Yeah, I would, I would do that trade. I think that would look good. Someone asks here, um, do I think Pan W has any chance to resume up, up move within the next few weeks or will it likely uh, remain sideways? Well, uh, hold on. Let me call uh, Nikesh Aurora, the CEO of Pan W. And find out for you. Uh-huh. Oh, you have no fucking idea? Yeah, me either. Oh, really? So nobody does. Okay, great. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, yeah. Uh, CEO has no fucking idea. And uh, guess what? Neither do I. Uh, right now, horizontal resistance is in the same uh, type of uh, nowhere land as some of the others we looked at between two SMAs. There's no reason to touch this stock at all. Um, so I assume you're asking because you probably either own it or have some calls in it, in which case then it's a matter of your long-term outlook that gets into things well beyond, uh, you know, typical, uh, technicals. And so do I think it, I mean, yeah, it can go up and go down right now. It's horizontal and it'll probably go where the market goes. Um, you, I mean, we really can't answer questions like that. Yeah, if you're going to sell an out of the money bullish put spread, you got a couple of, uh, you've got a really nice long term trend line here, and you've got the 200 day moving average, plus you got horizontal support at the low end of the compression. 
uh, wouldn't be my favorite pick because that drop didn't happen by mistake. There is a reason they sold it, and there's a reason they sold it hard. Uh, just going to take a look to see if there's uh, 275, 70. You'll probably have a decent credit in it. And, yeah, it's got actually a big credit, so you can go well below, go down to the 200-day moving average, which puts you down at 270. So take a look there. See what that's got, 270.65. And there you can get one by 120. So, yeah, you can get down below that 100-day moving average. If you're bullish, eh, okay, that'd be a way to play it and to take advantage of accelerated time decay. So I would not be I would not be bullish on it. Neutral to bullish about is about as good as you'll get out of me, and that's a fairly neutral trade. Thoughts on PayPal? Um, let me see. I don't have any thoughts on PayPal. It's flat. It's a little pretty flat today, but the market is up. It had a nice run up since uh, last Wednesday or two Wednesday, two weeks ago. It's been running up pretty hot since then. Um, I mean, pretty hot. I mean, it went from 62 to 66, whatever. Or actually, it went eh, from 59 to 60 to 66. So 10% jump in the last two weeks. Um, obviously, taking a breather here. It's a little bit extended from its EMA um really wouldn't touch it right now it's certainly not showing any relative strength um so not going to do anything with uh with that um and i didn't call him a dumbass for sewage i just basically said there's no fucking way we could possibly know that that's all um you can read into that as you will um okay. Question on MU, Micron, nice big breakout post earnings. You can see how the stock is continuing to move higher. I wrote a, read a blip somewhere. I think Barron's was talking about how they think this could be one of the next big AI stocks. So you're going to hear a lot of that too, by the way, now that AI is so hot, everybody's going to have the next darling. So, you know, the price action for it's been pretty decent. It has historically been a very choppy, kind of chunky, stock and you can see that in here so know that there is there are some speculators out here buying on that story you can see burns comes on on sunday so there's your long green candle you want to make sure that that's able to preserve for quite a while in here and then if the stock is able to hold all these gains post earnings yeah it might be pretty legitimate move and then look to maybe sell an out of money bullish put spread in this gap right in here that could work, but give it a little more time than that. I like to give it usually about a week to two weeks. So you're kind of in that window right now where you want to see it hold all of that right there. But doing pretty well, given that the market's been inching its way lower the last few days, it's been able to hold these gains pretty well. Um, let's say here, do, 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 do. Um, Okay, will I opt out of a trade if ATR is too low, or is it more appropriate to look at ATR percentage and size appropriately? Yeah, it's your ladder. I mean, look, I don't like, personally, I just don't like low ATR stocks. Why? I, to be honest, I find them boring, that's all. Um, but the reality is that has nothing to do with the method there, right? I mean, if, if, if everything looks good and the ATR in a stock is 30 cents, um, then just size accordingly. Doesn't mean don't take the trade. It just means size accordingly, right? I mean, uh, if you're going to go up uh, 30 cents on a um, thousand shares, uh, great. Um, depending on the, you know, usually a low ATR indicates a cheaper price stock as well. So, you know, that tends to mean you can get more option contracts or you can get more shares of the stock. And that compensates for the low uh, ATR, right? I mean, is there, if you got a uh, uh, 100 shares of a stock that has an ATR of a, um, a dollar, um, and then if you saw a stock with ATR of, of 10 cents and you got a thousand shares, it's the same thing, right? The same type of move is going to result in the same type of uh, of premium of um, of profit. Um, how is the spy strangle doing? Thanks, Sean. Uh, right now it's uh, down a bit. Um, I need spy to uh, move, obviously. 
and I needed to move upwards. Uh, right now, the best move for the strangle would be if spy continues up. Um, but it's still another day in that strangle, so I'm still holding on and waiting to see how it does. Um, and then I read your tweet about trolls. Fuck them. They take credit for wins. You know what? Here's my pr big problem with trolls. If you're going to troll, just don't be a fucking idiot. I mean, honestly, people let their hatred of someone get so, like, blinding that they'll post anything. And it doesn't make sense. Like, if you're going to troll me and criticize a trade or something, but, like, people criticize trades that I made hundreds of thousands of dollars on. It, it's like, find something legitimate to criticize, and I'll engage and, and have a debate with you even on it if it's legitimate. But trolls just get stupider and stupider, and they just throw shit out all the time. And when that doesn't work, they start to lie, and they start to make shit up. And it's just, that just drives me crazy. And I have some trolls that are just obsessive. Like, like they're taking hours of time to put together these fucking flow charts of my trades. And it's like, look, back in May of 2022, <laughs> he made a bad trade. Well, great. Don't trust any trader that only makes good trades. Seriously. If, if you have a trader that's showing 100% win rate, they're full of shit. Any trader the best traders in the world are going to have bad trades. They're going to have losing trades and you need to see those. You learn from those just as much as you learn from winning trades. You learn from what's wrong. So yeah, I mean, do I like losing trades? No, but I mean, it's part of what we do. As long as we average out ahead and we average out to make a living doing this, you have great financial independence, but trolls don't seem to get that. They're just so, blinded by the fact that they messed up or that they didn't do well or they got kicked out of a community for trolling and they're so upset about it that they come in with this blind hatred and you know just if you're going to troll be smarter honestly make it entertaining make it something i can engage with something i can debate have a point have a kernel of a point in there but unfortunately they're generally too fucking stupid to to be anything worth more than just a troll no, oh, I get the same thing. Mine doesn't even have to be trade related. Pete sells software, so he's a bad person. Well, don't buy my damn software. Come and watch the live event. I don't charge you a freaking nickel. All I do is fill every event and every video I do with really good analysis, and I teach you how to trade a system. He give you good picks video after video, and you don't have to pay me a penny. But he's a shell because he sells software. <laughs> okay, whatever. Your loss. Seriously. I mean, it should be a pretty easy thing to look at. If something gives you value, then you should get it. I mean, if you can afford it, obviously. But, you know, in the trading space, I get the cynicism particularly the world of YouTube where people are constantly selling bullshit courses that promise you to get rich quick off of crap methods all the time um, because that can kind of, you know, weigh on you and be like, all right, everyone out here is just a grifter, right? So do your own research, look at it, make sure the person's legitimate, make sure that, that what they're offering is going to be useful I never endorse anything that I don't use. If I use it, I endorse it. I'm not chilling for anything. I'm not chilling for Pete. I'm not chilling for GC2000, Trade Exchange, or even Ameritrade. I'm just saying, I use this shit. It works for me. Option Stalker works for me. I love the platform. I love the scans on it. I love, uh, I like Ameritrade. I like Thinkorswim. I like the functionality on it. I mean, probably because I'm used to it, right? Maybe if I started with another one, I'd like that one. But that's the one I use. That's the one I like. So I'm just going to tell people, this is what I use and what works for me. Look into it, try it, get it. I think the chat room in one action, one option is one of the best out there, if not the best, because there are professional traders in there and you can learn a lot. One alert in that chat room can make you the, the annual fee uh, for, for the whole thing. And I've seen it time and time again, right? So I'm never going to recommend something I don't use and that I don't feel works for me. And that's just all I can say, right? I mean, that, that's just, you know, if it works for me, I'm going to recommend and say you should try it. 
if you're serious about trading. Uh, the journal, I mean, I use um, uh, TraderSync as, as the journal. Are there better journals out there? Probably. That's the one I like. That's the one I'm comfortable with. That's the one I use. Um, and it's also integrating things like uh, walkaway analysis into it. So great. You want to use a different journal, use a different journal, but use a journal, right? One way or the other. Okay. Um, I taught, we talked about my opinion on ARM. Uh, you know, there's not much you can do there in terms of, uh, of technicals. I mean, yeah, it's, it's above its 50 moving average. It is an IPO. It is condensing here. If you get a real, if you get a break above 146, 50, it's probably a good bullish sign, but it's, it's going to be very volatile stock. Um, and it's going to go with the other, um, chips. So that's, uh. You, I mean, I don't know if you have any other ideas on ARM there. Uh, you know, we've kind of covered that one. So I told you, set your yeah. high and your low above the compression and wait for a breakout. What are my thoughts on DJT, Donald J. Trump stock? You mean a company that uh, makes uh, $4 million in revenue is currently valued at $2 billion? I don't know. It's a <laughs> up. You want my honest opinion? Wiki 2.0 shit It's probably one of the best shorts uh, in a long time, right? Uh, this shot, this stock is overvalued by about a thousand, uh, just in terms of pure fundamentals, just in terms of pure what it's worth. So, what you have on a stock like this, obviously, is a ton, a ton of retail activity on the options, and that is driving it. So, you have a dedicated fan base, which is driving a ton of retail activity which is pumping up this stock, uh, which is currently at 67. If this stock was correctly valued, it'd probably be at four. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, you have, but look at the premiums. Look at the 300% the IV on this stock. Th that tells you exactly what I'm talking about, which is market makers are well aware that, yeah, a good play would be go to May 17th, and buy the 40 puts, which are $27 out of the money, a 0.17 delta. But guess what? Those puts are $11. So <laughs> that's why, right? Like that would be a good play. And market makers know it would be a good play, which is why they made those puts $11 fucking dollars. So am I going to do that play? No, uh, because this stock could get pumped up for hell longer than May. I know that at some point, at some point down the line, this stock is going to drop, right? If I were to play it, I'd probably take the shares. I'd probably just short the shares uh, and hold it for as long as it takes until it drops. But that's how I would do it. But there's nothing technical about that play. I have a question on ENPH. So I put that chart up and you can see longer term trend lines here using our automated trend lines that is a gigantic wedge formation you need to wait for a breakout one way or the other you do not trade in here because we don't know which way it's going to break well water shots is asking peter are there any videos you have where you do market tech analysis and if so what is the channel there are plenty Constantly, Pete's got tons. Just go to the One Option website and you'll see a ton of videos there. And you can just go to his YouTube channel as well. So uh, there's a huge history um, uh, that you might, you might do, you, you can find there. Um, and thanks, Dr. Okay. Jay, for saying that if someone as air quotes stable as me can be profitable. You believe anyone can. I'm glad I stand as a shining example of someone who might not be, uh, let's just say, um, uh, and can still make, right? I, I think I hear what you're, I, I'm on you. I got, I got you. I got you. But yeah, uh, Gizmo, you're right. I'm, I got schmots. You know, I'm, a, I'm wicked schmots. So there's that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know yeah, Harry, I'm going to show people a really cool feature. If you're on the trial or if you're a member, you go into the edge and then you click daily market analysis. And this is something that will put together for us about 18 months ago. And members are actually taking my comments from the chat room each day. And so you can go back and select a month. 
So let's, you know, we can go back into January, for instance. And once I select the month, then I'm going to see every single day listed. The whole day. So now let's just, I'll randomly maybe, you know, I'll pick on this day here. And what that's going to do is it's going to load a chart where you can see my pre-open market comments. And then you'll be able to see every one of my market comments through the course of the day. But you can click on these little dots and then you'll get to see what my next comment was. And then you click on the next dot and you can see what the market actually did. So there's my comment. I said the market was going to go higher Then the market goes higher. In some instances, it might be, hey, the market's pretty neutral. Here's what I'm looking for to get bullish. It's a really cool feature. And, you know, I appreciate uh, the members stepping in and helping to put this together because this is going to stand the test of time. And it's not just, you know, uh, you can go back and look at what my prior comments were, what price action I was looking for, what told me that the market was going to go higher, and then you can actually see it play out. So long after I'm done posting comments in the chat room, you'll still be able to go back and use this as a learning resource. Okay. Um, any thoughts on Tilray? It's under $5. I don't have thoughts on stocks under $5 other than avoid them. Uh, would be interesting to see how many people claim to be profitable on subs like regular day trading are actually profitable. Almost no one is backing up with statistics over time. Look, it is not, it's easy to, to Photoshop anything. It's easy to, to um, I'm even hearing now that Kinfo can be manipulated. What I do is here's the trade. It's in real time. Here's the contract, the option, whatever it is. Here's the position size. Look on time and sales. Every single platform that you can trade with shows you what's being bought and when. If I say I just bought 20 calls on something or 100 call, whatever it is, uh, you can look on time and sales and see did someone just buy what he just said was bought? And it's there, right? And then when I close the trade, you can now also look and see, is that what happened? Did that trade close at that amount and in, in that number of contracts? All right there. That is the, because you cannot manipulate time and sales, right? That is a, a federally mandated reporting system that every platform has. You can't manipulate it. It's there. It, it, it's exactly what happened. So that to me is your best evidence of any type of, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, profitability, p &L, whatever. There's a reason why others don't do that. They're, they're either trying to brag or they're trying to grip. It's the easiest thing in the world to say, oh, I made 50,000 or I did this. And 90% or more are not. And even those that are generally don't give back to the community. They don't want to. Why? I mean, it's a pain in the ass. Sorry, but most of you guys are. Not most. Some of you. Well, a lot. Well, I don't know. I, I think most people are a pain in the ass anyway, so don't take it personally. But there's no reason to for most people. They don't care. Uh, so, yeah, I would take almost all of it with a huge grain of salt. And you can go back and check every one of my YouTube videos. I've got a thousand videos on my channel that span 15 years. They're all time stamped. You can go back and see what the market was doing at the time. I encourage you go and look for the biggest market moves you can find on a daily chart and then go and watch the videos from that same time period and see how we trade it. You know, did I get it right? If so, what told me that there were some warning signs in the market. What told me that we were going to see a trend reversal? That's what you really need to be able to identify and pick up on. So they're just incredible lessons on my YouTube channel. And, you know, just like I showed you, everything I say in the chat room is time stamped. It's archived. You can go back. You can see what I said, what the market did. So there's many, many ways to uh, confirm. One final point on that is, don't worry about what anybody else is making. Just worry about yourself. Worry that you're in a good place and that you've got good resources and that you've got a good systematic approach that you're learning and following. Focus on that and don't worry about 
anybody else. They don't matter. I agree. Uh, any thoughts on Max Pain theory? Does it describe any of your market makers well? Not necessarily market makers. I mean, look. I mean, it's it's the price point that uh, that uh, asserts the most collateral damage to option holders, right? Uh, the idea behind it is that option writers, sellers of options, are have more resources, which is another fancy way of saying they're mainly towards the institutional side, right? Most traders, retail in particular, do not write options. They buy options. And so if you're writing options, you have a lot more uh, capital behind you, a lot more resources, so on. And the idea being that those who are writing options want the max pain price. And so they're able to help steer the, the price of the stock towards that, uh, you know, they can kind of try to pin it. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's good to know. It's good to know what it is. Uh, then have it in mind if you see it starting getting pinned to a price that might be relevant. I, I don't put a huge amount of credence into it, but th there's something to Max Payne. I'm not saying there isn't something to Max Payne, but it's really more about just so you know, the option writers uh, and option sellers than it is about the market makers. The market makers are just balancing. They're just buying and selling and buying and selling each side to balance and keep a net neutral, right? It's the ones who are on the on the writing side of the equation, which sometimes are market makers because they have to write against a lot of the uh, purchase options. But uh, it's really more about the institutions on that. And it's more relevant when you're within, let's say that you're close, like NVIDIA on April 19th, 775. Let's say that NVIDIA is somewhere around a $780, $785 level. When you're kind of within range of that max pain number, then there is a greater likelihood that it could migrate to that $775 level. But when you're way away from it, like right now we're $250 away from it, it's not going to be very relevant. Yeah. Any insight on how institutions sell to rebalance mutual funds for the quarter at open end of day throughout the day? I'm not sure how that's exactly relevant, but I mean, look, at the open, institutions will place, uh, you know, market orders, right, to be executed at the opening bell if they want it to be out quickly. Um, and there's sometimes the opening uh, auction that uh, exchanges will have. Uh, end of day, you have market on the MOC, market on close orders throughout the day. It's generally uh, volume matching algorithmic trading. Um, when you're looking at it, I, guess you, I mean, the only thing that would matter would be in terms of market impact. And uh, the market impact is large orders on that type of rebalancing could potentially move the market. Um, but uh, directionally, it's not, I'm not even sure what, uh, why I would even think about that in terms of my trading. But if you have a reason, George, if you can kind of, um, put that in. I mean, they're going to rebalance based on any changes that happen that quarter that they feel they should uh, reallocate generally towards or away from equities, right? So right now, if you look at the volume on the market, it's certainly not, uh, you know, they're not selling equities, but they're also not buying it right now. The market's sort of at a low volume pause. So I wouldn't anticipate much in terms of rebalancing right now, but in, in mutual funds. But Pete, I don't know. Do you have any insight on mutual fund rebalancing into quarter? Well, from what I've read, most funds are starting to go month to month and not quarter to quarter. So there's, it, it tends to even out. There's not as much volatility towards the end of the quarter. But my suspicion is that they will take what they need to do and hand it off to a company like Citadel and go, here's what we need to do in the next three days. And then Citadel... Right will go, okay, we'll take care of that for you. So they don't have to worry about buy and sell and balances or market impact. They let Citadel, who's got tons and tons of algorithms that they use to figure out how they can most effectively enter and exit positions, they'll let them handle it. So it said, Pete, I am in hood. I'm up 10%. Would you do me the honor of helping me figure out when I should get out? 
Hood, okay. Let me take a look at Hood. Wow, I like the bullish hammer today. That's nice. The fact that the stock is continuing to move higher, it's broken out through this. It's got actually a very nice long head of steam in here. Well, the first thing is I would be looking for any kind of bearish engulfing candle only because the stock has run up so far. So if today we had opened here and this finished as a long red candle, that I'd be more worried about. But buyers have actually come in and they've supported this move. Stock has been up, up, up. When the market is down, 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 you get any kind of market tailwind. Stock should be able to continue higher. It's got excellent volume. So as long as the stock on a D1 basis is continuing to show relative strength to the overall market, you want to stay in it. You want to continue to ride it. But as soon as you start seeing the market rally and the stock not being able to participate, then you have to be more cautious with it. So what you don't want to see is a day when the, mark, when the stock is down and the market is up. That'd be a sign that it's starting to peak out a little bit, maybe take some chips off the table. Right now, I like it. Looks good. Let me see. Pick of the day for me. What was your pick of the day again, Pete? I was Verizon, right? VZ. Verizon. Um, for me, my pick of the day, I think, I really like CI, um, but... I do like bounces off support here, and um, I like this hold on Apple. I'm torn between Apple and CI. I'm going to go with CI as my pick of the day. I like CI. And my caveat to trading VZ is market first, market first. I want to see this downward sloping trend line breached to the upside before I even consider any longs right now. I think we could see that perhaps as early as tomorrow. We've got a holiday coming up. There's your trend line. Let's call it somewhere around the 522 level. I want to see the market above 522. I don't want to be floundering around and drifting lower. I want to see some dang strength. And when I see that strength, I'd like to see Verizon holding its breakout nice and strong. Want it above this AV WAP. I want it above this horizontal was resistance now support. I want it above the opening price today, which was 41.12. It's got to be above $41, let's call it, or I don't have any interest in it. So give me that market breakout. Let me see the stock preserve this breakout. Let me have it with some relative strength any little bit of volume like it's got today, then I like it. So that's probably what I'll be reviewing on Sunday, Easter Sunday. So yeah, again, got a holiday coming up. So keep it light, folks. Not a lot going on right now. And today, eh, we've been able to form a base. We're starting to poke out above this uh, VWAP here. We've got a higher low double bottom, a compression down here. I think we've seen the extent of the selling so far. We've seen a little bit of selling pressure recently. Let's make sure we don't need to go chasing anything with a couple of hours left. If we can start kind of getting some of those green candles that we've been waiting for in here in March, 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 higher, attack this downward sloping alert line here, get above it. Those would be really positive signs, and we could see it. Earnings season coming up and should be some end of month, beginning of the month buying. But I need to see those signs before I stick my neck out. There you go. All right, Harry. Thanks so much. And uh, good luck with your trading, everyone. Have a happy Easter, and we will see you uh, next week. I'll probably do a video on Sunday. So we'll see you then. Sounds good, everyone. Bye now. Bye-bye.